a plane with the unlikely name, the Mango, the Transavia PL-12 M300. This little utility, with military applications as an ambulance, a spotter and a communications aircraft, is an adventurously designed and highly distinctive looking modern aeroplane. Why does it look like it does? For example, what virtues do the twin booms have that the designer employed them? The fuselage shortened high, and the little second wing with the undercarriage, how did they get like that? It's not a conventional looking aeroplane at all, yet despite being a piston-engined aircraft, it doesn't look like a relic of a bygone age. Obviously, everything about any aircraft design is settled by the designer's choice to complement the overall success of the plane. Functional considerations will decree that a transport will have different attributes from a fighter. The Mango is an unrestrainedly functional design which serves its aerial jeep role very well. Yet it's actually a mutation, being derived from a plane which was designed for a totally different role. At Transavia's factory in Sydney, Australia, variations on the PL-12 have been developed and refined around a basic design that's proved very adaptable and reliable. The PL-12s are extremely simply constructed, very robust and easy to service. There has been a presiding consideration to have the little plane be as practical to operate as possible. It's lightweight, yet sturdy. Its simplicity of construction is the result of a lot of complicated and exact calculation and consideration. Its original configuration was as an agricultural aircraft, as a crop duster, cedar, firefighter. It's not super fast, but it doesn't need to be. However, it is agile, responsive and a delight to its pilots, because if you're going to buzz around feet off the ground dodging trees, fences and barns, then you need a plane that cooperates in keeping you alive. The Sky Farmer agricultural aircraft, as the original PL-12 air truck developed, was constructed around a large hopper and the design variant was dictated to by the practical concerns of effectively operating as a crop duster. The hopper had to be easy to fill, and the plane capable of operating from unprepared strips. As an industrial tool, reliable continuous operation would be needed for cost-effective use, as would a long life expectancy. To a large extent, as a special purpose aircraft, the design is ageless. The task has been addressed directly, and the results are a sort of optimum. This little plane does its job very well. It's no doubt fortuitous for its manufacturer that the design has proved as impressively flexible as it has, but it is, for consideration of the Sky Farmer, not as important as the plane's success at its dedicated task. One aspect of the plane that shows the degree of design sophistication revolves around the little stub wings. All aircraft generate vortices around their wingtips, and these would be valuable in dispersing the sprays or fertilizers spread by a crop duster, but with a normal layout, they're too far out to have any effect. With the PL-12, the vortices around the end of the stub wings feed the outer wing vortices and serve to give the little plane a very wide sweep with each pass. In addition, of course, the stubs give extra wing surface and lift and give a variation of the sort of controllability associated with small biplane aircraft enhancing the little plane's enviable agility. The Sky Farmer is a successful modern aeroplane, admittedly a very unusual looking one. This is also an aircraft. I say this because it's not immediately apparent at all that this mess of scaffolding and wheels is designed to take to the air. 
particularly when it's perched on top of a pole. However, this is the German VFW Corporation's SC-1262 hover rig, a test aircraft conducted as part of the development of the VAC-191, an ultimately unsuccessful vertical takeoff fighter design which employed both the vectored thrust of its main engine and the lift of two dedicated engines pointing down out of the fuselage. The hover rig was constructed to allow work on systems to give the pilot of the VAC some control of the plane when it was in hover and its normal flight control surfaces were neutralized. A distinctly strange and almost comically unlikely looking aircraft. But the hover rig was constructed to conduct serious experiments and the history of flight is constructed with such test programs. It's unlikely that much of interest to an aircraft engineer was gleaned in finding out how many men could fit into the engine compartment of an F-80. But putting ramjets on the wingtips can make the same type of aircraft a seriously interesting test bed. The ramjet, with no moving parts and a theoretical infinite power output, has fascinated aircraft designers, offering much and as a result being tested extensively. Here, obviously, the power output is not on trial. Any attempt to wind these ramjets out would rip the wings off the F-80 as though they were perforated toilet paper, well before the engine chambers melted. Instead, the fighter allows the engines to be brought up to operating speed and, within the limitations of the airframe, the engines can then demonstrate that they work. Where this testing is fairly limited and unsophisticated, ramjets have been at the heart of some very highly sophisticated tests. And one of these, the Lockheed X-7 project, serves to give an insight into how designers work. In part, it's interesting because it was Lockheed's first step into pilotless planes. But it's also important in the history of modern missilery and the development of ramjet engines. Lockheed's famous designer, Kelly Johnson, outlines the beginnings of the program. Just after the war, when the United States was getting into its guided missile program, Lockheed had to evaluate what part it could take in such a program. We felt we were primarily an airframe manufacturing organization, and at the time did not think that we had capabilities in the field of radar and guidance that were necessary to complete an overall guided missile program. Some time before, we had established a procedure whereby, with a very few good men, we were able to design and build the F-80 Shooting Star in 141 days. The basic philosophy of the Lockheed Company, which reflected so strongly in this performance, had been carried forward naturally through the X-7 project. The application of this philosophy has proven that a few well-qualified people can produce more per year and more per dollar than a larger group of less qualified people having the attendant large organizational and operational problems. Ben Rich joined the aerodynamics and thermodynamics department of Lockheed and worked first on the propulsion system for the F-104. On the U-2 and SR-71, he worked on the overall airplane design. I have no question but that the future of the Skunk Works is in very good hands under Ben Rich. Well, the whole principle of the Skunk Works with Kelly uh, is based on three things. Uh, Kelly believes in integrity, responsibility, and authority. And uh, integrity is, is the one thing that Kelly has really stressed in the Skunk Works. You don't build anything you don't believe in. And Kelly's illustrated this many times at the Skunk Works. Uh, we had a contract many years ago to build a liquid hydrogen airplane going, you know, 2.5, 2 2 100,000 feet. And uh, the airplane was going to turn out to be an aerodynamic, wide-bodied dog. And Kelly went back to the Air Force and returned the $96 million that he had. Now, we have another axiom in the Skunk Works that if it works, don't fix it. Keep it simple. You know the KISS theorem. Keep it simple and stupid. If you make the things that a college professor with a PhD has to run it, it won't work.
We design, we implement, we prototype, we put it in production, and we follow the entire program from, the, from its birth to its death. And there are very few people in this world who have that opportunity. The design of the X7 could have taken any of a number of forms, but these were sorted through, and after extensive consideration and assessment, the final configuration was settled. That shape had then to be refined, and the ancillary systems for its use sorted out. In some cases, entirely new answers were found for old problems, because of the specific nature of the testing to be conducted. Wherever possible, the design team worked to keep the expense of the program down and many aspects were sorted out in miniature, in wind tunnels or, as here, with rockets to, to confirm or sometimes debunk the designer's theories. Back in the late 40s, there were no digital computers around to test theory in the abstract. One example of the design challenge in the system is that the Lockheed team had to come up with a new parachute system to operate effectively when the X-7 was travelling at supersonic speeds. Once again, in the interests of economy, a stage of preliminary testing employed one-third scale models to provide data on roll stability, lift, drag and separation behaviour. Making the scale examples not only allowed economy in construction, but permitted the use of a P-38 Lightning as a mothership for the test flights. The whole area of remotely controlled but autopiloted aircraft was in its infancy, not only a new field for Lockheed. The X-7 was not a target-seeking missile, but its development required the creation of very complex electronics in the autopilot, preset flight program director and ground-operated remote controls operating through a radar link. A complete telemetry system had to be devised to log test data, together with a host of other peripheral electronics and recorders. The Lockheed team were designing not only the aircraft, but the whole experimental system's hardware to monitor and assess its performance. With the first X-7s constructed and the test systems developed, the actual series could commence. The aim of the program was to assess the viability of ramjet engines, then largely an area of theory rather than established practice. Engines of this type had been incorporated into the design of the Bomark missile, and the X-7 was to be the test bed to assess these engines in hypersonic flight. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Around 80 successful test flights were conducted with the X-7 and its later developments out of a total of over 130. And a bewildering variety of problems were encountered during the series. These included radar control and autopilot failure, human error in the operation of the complicated ground systems, and some design problems, both ergonomic and aerodynamic. However, the missile's superb performance record eventually became an item of significant pride to Lockheed. Along the way, the X-7s consistently revealed failings in the Marquette company's ramjets, and it was the availability of these sturdy and reliable Lockheed test drones that afforded the hard data which was needed for the refinement of the ramjets into usable power plants. 
Typical of the X7's simple yet practical problem solving was the fact that it was designed to land, if that's the word, by driving the specially hardened nose spike into the ground and stand like a pillar, waiting the ground retrieval crews, who carted it back to be refurbished in preparation for its next mission. There were over 60 X7 aircraft, including some designated XQ5s, which were designed to be used as high-speed target drones. Now, although there were some spectacular crashes in the test series, the target drones proved to be relative failures in their allotted role because they were almost impossible to shoot down. They were too fast. The X7s had by then proved capable of very high speeds, with the top speed achieved being Mach 4.31, 2,881 miles per hour, and their performance proved significantly higher than that of the surface-to-air weapons they were designed to test. This was acutely embarrassing to the various government agencies and manufacturers involved in the weapon systems. There are many uses for pilotless aircraft, and being target practice for new weapons, or for new pilots, is one of them. Pretty obviously, the job of pilot on a target that's to be blown out of the sky by a missile is one that there would be very few applicants for. Despite their disposable nature, target drones must be well-built and designed aircraft, with complete internal controls and stability and a handy turn of speed. They present a perhaps unglamorous, but very challenging design task to the aviation engineer. more rewarding to the designer is to be involved in a project like the HIMAT drone. HIMAT stands for Highly Maneuverable Aircraft Technology and the aim of the series was in part to address and defeat the so-called stall barrier, limiting the angle of attack that a plane may adopt, to free fighter pilots further in aerial combat. The project was carried out by the Rockwell Corporation and the drone is actually a host of very advanced aeroplanes. The HIMAT consists of an advanced jet core aircraft to which can be affixed different arrangements of wings, canards, tails, engine inlets and jet nozzles. Thus a large number of combinations can be tried out and the advantages, disadvantages and relationships within various settings can be studied. An enormous amount of very expensive prototype production and testing has been accomplished with the one aircraft not only saving money, but compressing years and programs into a very successful single test series. The internal coherence of the results obtained has informed the follow-on multinational X-31 fighter project. Like the X-7, the HIMAT drone has been involved, at the cutting edge of the technology of its day, in, in the development and testing of new aviation design and hardware. However, drone aircraft have developed over most of aviation's history, and their design evolution has branched repeatedly, so that today they play many different roles. For example, during World War I, the United States saw the development of the first flying bomb. These tests of the plane known as the Bug were conducted under the technical supervision of Orville Wright and significantly one of the young officers involved was Hap Arnold. The involvement of these illustrious names did not guarantee the program against failures. The little biplane did work occasionally but its military significance was more in what it heralded rather than in any damage it may have been capable of causing itself. By the 1930s, when this little target drone was developed, one of the bug's major deficiencies, its lack of guidance, was being looked at. Like today's model planes, the aircraft obeyed a handheld radio control unit. Interestingly, this unit employed a telephone dial to send the selected signal to the drone. As with all target drones, there was a balance between the disposability of the aircraft and the sophistication necessary for it to do its job. 
and in this case, as a target, the plane didn't really present a simulation of an enemy aircraft. However, ground troops could fire away at it and presumably learn something before it was blown away. Something altogether more developed in the way of drones was to appear during the Second World War. Constructed in Germany, Hitler's terror weapons led into action by the V-1. This was not a rocket, it was a pulse jet powered pilotless aeroplane which carried a one ton warhead. It was 23 feet long and had a wingspan of 17 feet. Over 30,000 were produced and over 8,000 were actually launched against the cities of Britain. The V-1 was relatively slow, with a top speed of 400 miles per hour, and nearly 4,000 of them were brought down by fighters or anti-aircraft artillery. Captured V-1s started to come back to the US for testing and evaluation as soon as they were available, and they were given intense scrutiny by scientists working on the equivalent American programs. Soon the US started producing its own copy of the V-1 in significant numbers and testing took place on a number of the aspects of missile design and use that have marked the post-war years. Included in these tests with the American V-1s were firings from submarines that are very prophetic even if they look a little ridiculous. During the war, the US had also worked on unpowered bomb carriers, glide bombs, which were radio controlled by the bombardier in fall. Another avenue of remote controlled drone experiments employed what were, for drones, very big aircraft. Referred to as weary willies, old bombers which had passed their life expectancy were retired in a very dramatic fashion, being packed with explosives and then flown by remote control into a target. But not all military drone development has been to do with flying bombs there have been several major advances in battlefield scout drones. This little observer, armed with television, was developed to give infantry a wider area of search and some knowledge of what was happening across the battlefield without risking heavy casualties in scouting and reconnaissance. Vietnam saw the deployment of a number of drones in several important roles. With the North Vietnamese armed to the teeth with the most advanced ground-based anti-aircraft defences ever tested in warfare, flying over the North became increasingly risky, and the little pilotless planes performed important reconnaissance and electronic suppression missions. Between 1965 and 1975, over 3,000 missions were flown by the remote piloted vehicles, and over 200 of them were actually shot down, which could have been 200 two-man reconnaissance or wild weasel aircraft. These things saved lives. The reconnaissance drones, flying quite low at 500 miles per hour, could get away with sweeps over the most highly defended areas. Their electronic countermeasures brethren would fly in dispensing chaff and using powerful transmitters to jam missile site radar guidance into uselessness. They'd fly in ahead of a raid, clearing the way. After a mission, the drones would be directed back into friendly airspace and there be retrieved by helicopters in a manoeuvre that could be difficult and dangerous. The 3,000 pound drones proving sometimes to be uncooperative and unwieldy. The drones in Vietnam point the way to some of the future options on the battlefield. 
Already there are drones that deploy their own drones in the form of tank hunting scouts and the missiles they can fire. If they're as effective as those drones used in Vietnam, they will be formidable indeed. One other interesting story about drones, or rather flying bombs, concerns the TOR. This was actually a pretty unsuccessful private piloted plane design. The manufacturers managed to interest the Defence Department in it for use as an anti-shipping weapon. The mutation used television and radio controls and was quite sophisticated in a lot of regards. After training, it was possible for an operator to pilot the planes quite proficiently, using the hazy television images. Interestingly, at the end of the war, some enterprising bargain hunters bought up surplus TOR mutations very cheaply and transformed them back into piloted private planes. Mutation of aircraft is almost constant. Most types go through several generations in the course of their production lives, as responses to faults or as improvements. There are mutations that go into production, or there are one-off test aircraft which study particular adaptations. Hence, a B-17 Flying Fortress with inline engines, or a P-47 Thunderbolt with counter-rotating props. Another area of mutation is not specifically dedicated to the type involved. For example, the response to the experience of fighters in mud with accidents and curtailed activity. This saw testing of different undercarriage for use in muddy conditions, which should be seen as not only applicable to the fighter type used in the tests, but to all fighters battling in mud. A further level of mutation can be seen as the development of characteristics of a particular plane into a completely different plane. A lot of the painstaking and expensive theoretical work carries over from one design to another. Although the derivation may be seen as superficial, the famous P-38 Lightning, one of the war's best fighters, was very influential on the development of another aircraft. This was the much bigger twin-forked devil from the Lockheed stable, the Chain Lightning XP-58. This plane was conceived as a fighter-destroyer, in a role very similar to that of the German Messerschmitt 110. The chain Lightning was also developed later to be used as a long-range escort fighter, in a basic enlargement of the Lightning. But in this, it proved to be too stolid to engage successfully in dogfighting. Plans were then redeveloped to see it in an anti-shipping role, but enthusiasm was waning, and though it could probably have been successfully deployed as an attack aircraft, it was not proceeded with. The legacy of the P-38 is evident throughout the layout of the chain lightning, with notable changes in scale, propellers and the inclusion of a second crewman in a turret at the rear of the fuselage. With a top speed of 436 miles per hour and a cruising range of 2,650 miles, the XP-58 had quite good performance for its day, but it was simply too heavy to be adequately manoeuvrable. Another type of mutation altogether appears when an aircraft is used as a test bed for technology being developed for a new type, as here with a B-26 being used to test the undercarriage under development for the B-47 jet bomber. However, the most interesting mutations have occurred within the same type, with the growth of a plane to fill new roles or to use new technologies, or simply to rectify things that were not right with the original design. 
When the English electric Canberra was selected as the B-57 for the United States Air Force, the Martin Company was contracted to build the British plane in the US. The Canberra, though fast and manoeuvrable for a bomber, had some very idiosyncratic design features, not least of which was the strange positioning of the crew, which made it highly unlikely that the bomb aimer would be able to escape the plane in an emergency. This problem and other limitations of the Canberra were resolved by Martin over the next year, and various improvements on the original were incorporated in the following models. These included Martin's revolving bomb bay and a welter of new equipment to turn the bomber into a night intruder and a reconnaissance plane. The B-57 went on to play a minor but very successful role in Vietnam. However, the mutation of the B-57 did not stop there. The development of the U-2 high-altitude reconnaissance intrusion aircraft was delayed, and as an interim measure, it was decided to develop an enlarged wing for the B-57 to enable it to fill the gap. Accordingly, what came to be known as the B-57D big wing aircraft took to the air. With a wingspan over 40 foot longer than the original bomber, these planes not only filled the gap while the U-2 was sorted out, but complemented it when it had been introduced being able to carry a greater load and hence conduct missions that the U-2 could not, especially in electronic information gathering. However, there were major problems with the stresses on the wing spar and the wings themselves proved to have very limited life expectancy. Later, emphasizing how valuable the B-57D had been, a further development, the B-57F, took to the air with a wingspan that was now a further 20 foot wide, only six foot short of twice the original Canberra span and these mutants performed very well at extreme heights. Perhaps the most impressive range of mutations ever developed from one aircraft type would be that large family of planes that are based on the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. This plane was the ultimate big bomber of the Second World War and carried over to bear a large load in the Korean campaign. The four-engined Superfortress built an enviable record in its original task and was the critical weapon in the reduction of Japan, maintaining a strategic campaign that wrought tremendous damage and brought World War II to a close. When they became outmoded, some of the B-29s were converted by the Air Force to use as aerial tankers and continued in their new role as KB-29s for quite a few years. There were heaps of spares and mothballed planes to be cannibalized to keep them in the air. Here, one of them refuels a mutation of the B-29, the B-50, which had bigger engines, a strengthened wing and a new tail that was so tall it had provision to fold it over so the plane would fit into the hangars. In a further mutation, some of the B-50s were fitted with auxiliary jet engines to pep up their performance when they too were passed on to the role of aerial tankers. This was essentially so that they could travel at speeds above the stall point of the fighter aircraft they were refueling. The matching of jet fighters with piston engine tankers was a difficult process, and while the KB-50s were successfully employed, as far as the fighters were concerned, they were far from ideal in their new role. The B-50 shared much the same fuselage as the B-29, but the actual cargo variant of the Superfortress was a very different looking plane. The C-97 had a completely different fuselage, with the look of being two fuselages, a new fat one superimposed on a remnant of the B-29 shape. Needless to say, the C-97s didn't take long to develop a tanker version, as the mutations of the original plane continued to proliferate. The most glamorous of the Superfortress variants was the Stratocruiser, Boeing's 1940s version of what a long-range passenger aircraft should be, luxuriously appointed and spacious with a bar downstairs. 
but the Stratocruiser wasn't a raging sales success and old age was catching up with the whole line. And after a while, the B-29s, B-50s and the rest were congregating at the wrecking yards, ready for scrapping. But for some of the C-97s and Stratocruisers, their bulging fuselages were to see them given a new lease of life. A company called Aerospace Lines, working on that commodious fuselage's basic virtues, started to build wildly distended hulls onto the planes to carry specialist cargo, including spacecraft, aircraft, rockets and other large, fully assembled pieces of hardware. These aeroplanes with goiters have proved very successful since the first one was built in 1962. The massive lobes allow fuselage heights which started at 20 feet and have now progressed beyond 25 feet with a cargo hold of over 39,000 cubic foot capacity. The later model Super Guppies, built to carry round components for the Saturn rocket program, have turboprops rather than the original piston engines and have a nose section that opens out for easy loading. Here, two of the experimental lifting body shapes, the X-24B and the HL-10, are loaded into a Super Guppy. It's difficult to imagine that there will be many planes which will undergo not just the number of variations that the B-29 has seen, but the absolute transformation that has occurred with the plane. After all, the B-29 was a model of super streamlining. Nothing bulged from that clean shape unnecessarily. The functional demand of the mission dictated a strict discipline in its smooth lines. So where did this great bloated whale with its puckered brow and lack of scale come from? The Douglas B-66, the Air Force version of the Navy A-3D, was first deployed as a tactical jet bomber by the US in 1955. It had a fairly long career, seeing a lot of service in Vietnam in electronics countermeasures and reconnaissance roles. Starting in 1961, two of these planes were rebuilt by the Northrop Company to be the X-21A experimental aircraft. Their peculiar camel hump and new wing were part of a determined assault on one of aviation's most enduring bugbears, the drag caused by disturbed air around the surface of a plane, particularly the broad surfaces of the wing, where undisturbed air would offer better lift and such reduction of drag that very meaningful fuel savings could be made. The idea being tested was to suck the air from the surface into the wing and then force it out the rear, effectively removing the turbulence and allowing smooth airflow. The basis of this was a porous wing surface. The system was refined to a testable condition for the first time for the X-21A program. Ultimately, the test series was to prove two things about the idea. Firstly, that it worked. And secondly, that it was wildly impractical. The maintenance required to keep all the passages in the wing clean and working, not to mention the holes in the exterior, was simply impossible there were no less than 815,388 metering holes and 67,944 tributary ducts in the wing. And the fact that the thing worked did not in any way change the fact that it was so expensive and hard to maintain as to be totally unusable except in experimental situations.
stretching the idea of mutations a little further, there have been planes that are designed to adopt different shapes to order. One such case being this little Boeing spotter plane. With impressively short takeoff and landing, and an almost impossibly low stall point, a functional little battlefield plane with a variety of roles to play. This little plane had another trick. It was the work of only a few minutes to fold back all the protruding wings and other aeroplane bits and it mutated into a trailer ready to be towed off by a jeep. designers had done a complete job. There were restraints for everything and everything worked neatly. An excellent and practical approach to the tactical need. Even if there is something a little unnerving about the idea of a plane which boasts as virtue that it folds up. Probably even more unnerving is the thought of a plane that arrives in a bag, totally collapsible. The Goodyear company worked this one out, a winged powered balloon with the most rudimentary looking control arrangements, which, despite their appearance, worked, providing a portable miniature spotter plane. As an example of the challenges that face designers of aircraft and their various ways of approaching answers, the matter of ultra-lightweight, single-person, practical, portable air vehicles is illuminating. Here, the designer can resort to virtually none of the huge body of knowledge that guides aviation. There's no way that you can start with the normal premise of a wing and work up from there if the user has to carry the thing around with him when it's not in use. Hence, a lot of arrangements for screwing pipes together, inflating rubber planes, rocket belts and other ideas have surfaced. The powered hang glider being possibly the most effective development to date. There's a sense of adventure about these kinds of aircraft and the designers have worked long and hard to reduce flight to the barest minimum needed in producing them. A lot of people fantasise about flying in such personal transport and a lot of people nowadays do it with kits they build in their garages. To date, it's difficult to see which will endure. Presumably the hang glider, which is simple and effective and looks good enough as design to stick around. Good design does endure. The Pitt Special, designed in 1944, an anachronistically biplane, has remained one of the best aerobatic planes in the world ever since. The intended role informed the designer so successfully that the choices he made then are still right now. Hitler's designers, working on his experimental planes and terror weapons, were following trails that have led in many cases straight to the modern day. The Germans built and tested many of the theoretical assessments of their designers, and the list of firsts associated with that intensely concentrated period of research is pretty staggering. After the war, of course, this research, and the researchers themselves, went into the service of the two developing Cold War camps, and their work went on being refined. In 
matters of rocketry and remote guided missilery, they made a number of significant advances, sorting out reliable power plants for their missiles and sorting out stable and controllable shapes for the whole contraptions. The Germans also made notable advances in control systems, in both radio control and in jamming-proof wire-linked controls. Presumably, with a system like this, it took some time to train the operator up to skillful guidance of the missiles. However, tests that were conducted showed the systems worked well, certainly well enough to have been a nuisance to have prowling about and a definite menace to shipping. The extensions on the rear of the wing of this model are for wire spools, physically connecting the missile to its controller in the parent aircraft. This missile, the HS-293, was used with both control systems. The wire link system requires miles of wire, spooling out from both the missile and the aircraft in two strands. This gave the controller a direct link to the missile and precluded any jamming of his control over it. The HS-293 developed into a more powerful version, the 294, which employed two rocket engines, otherwise being pretty similar, what we would call an air-to-surface missile. The Luftwaffe also put money into the development of air-to-air -air missiles for use against the big Allied bombers. In this case, the missile again used wire linking, but this time it's designed to rotate in flight, winding the wires around one another as it went. It was designed for use with any of the planes employed as night fighters and probably with the day fighter forces as well. The Germans would perhaps have been better occupied in manufacturing more of their jet and rocket fighters, which with heavy cannon could have cut swathe through the bomber forces. But the concept has, as we know, been refined constantly since the war, and their pioneering has become the dominant air-to-air -air attack format. There have been times since the war when it's been widely believed that manned aircraft were all outmoded, and the air would be, in terms of aerial warfare, totally the domain of the missiles, with intercontinental missiles to replace strategic bombers and a range of other missiles to replace everything else except transport and passenger planes. After all, it was reasoned, it wouldn't be safe over a battlefield in a manned plane. In fact, it may not be safe anywhere in a manned plane if the balloon, as they say, went up. What, of course, they overlooked is the phenomenon of machine stupidity. The smarter robots become, the narrower the theoretical gap between human mind and computer becomes, the more evident the complexity of animal intuition and intelligence becomes. Most of the guidance systems of missiles have at one time or another been subverted by interference, distraction or blinding. And the missiles, most of the time, don't even know they're being fooled. From the early Gorgon onwards, the US has been the post-war leader in missilery. There have been times when the Soviets have managed to stolidly produce large numbers of their missiles, but the technological edge and sophistication of the United States hardware has been maintained. Along the way, there have been some spectacular successes and some equally spectacular failures. During the last four decades, the proliferation of missiles and drones has been astonishing. Today, stockpiles of missiles are enormous. 
And with the thawing of global relationships, it's noticeable that both of the superpowers are concerned to redress the situation. Both wary and cautious about leaving themselves exposed, but equally aware that the acronym MAD is descriptive of the situation in two ways, as it was intended and as it is obvious. Today's missiles are an insane reality to tolerate, is not to belittle the reasons for their development. In a world confronted by Joseph Stalin, the idea of the largest and nastiest possible protection has undoubtedly a lot to recommend it. Nor should distaste for the weapons in any way lessen the achievement of those who designed and built them. These things have represented a massive challenge to their creators, and along the way they've hurried the development of computers and many other electronic advances. Their guidance, piloting and target-seeking skills have required and still require constant breakthroughs, constant overtakings by countermeasures and then further advances. Missiles have created their own merry-go-round of development, increasingly sophisticated, increasingly capable. They are the subject of the work of some of the most brilliant minds of the era, and their side benefits to science and technology have been enormous. For the scientists, they have provided a breathtakingly rapid ride into a digitalized world, an exacting and exact series of tasks. With a missile, there's no pilot to correct for deviation from desired performance during testing. If it doesn't work perfectly, it doesn't work at all. The highest state of refinement of missilery to date is the cruise missile ground-hugging and, for the moment, virtually unstoppable. We can hope that, if the signs in Eastern Europe have any long-term substance, the cruise missile will be the last generation of this craziness, and the world will be able to thank the missiles for three things. For their contributions to science and aviation, for their contribution to peace over the past decades, and for disappearing. <laughs>